thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, when I accepted the invitation, uh, I thought it was going to be very simple, that all I had to do was give a similar sort of talk last year, and I would just have to sort of tweak it. So much has happened in the last year that I've really had to sort of almost revise most of my slides. Um, I also should point out we've, that we do now, as of this week, we are a centre of excellence. We're the 50th U uh, European uh, centre of excellence, and uh, so we're the 12th in the UK. I've got a lot of slides to go through, and I'm going to go quite fast, for which I apologise, but I'm very happy to share my slides with, uh, with anybody if you want to contact me afterwards. Now, I went back. did that not move forward? What do you use this one, is it? There's an arrow button here, but that, oh, here we go. Nope. No, it's this one. Sorry, wrong button. So, what, what's the problem we're dealing with? Well, this is the distribution of uh, bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumours within lung cancer. So you can see, and if, particularly if we exclude small cell lung cancer, it's very small numbers. Having said that, um, it is important because when we look at the different types, and I just sort of as introduction, the typical, the atypical, the large cell neuroendocrine tumours, uh, and I've, I've, all the historically small cell tumours have been included, but I think it's really very questionable whether they should be included. Clearly, there is very different clinical behaviour, and that's very important. So what I'm going to run through in the course of the next 20 minutes or so is the incidence epidemiology, a little bit on causation, presenting, presenting symptoms, some of the diagnostic techniques, which Tahir has already covered. Um, Was is going to discuss the medical therapies, and uh, we'll see how time goes if I've got enough to, time to discuss the follow-up. So this, this is an older slide. There's, more re there's a more recent one, but I think this one kind of illustrates much, much more clearly in the blue line that all the neuroendocrine tumors are increasing in incidence and, in fact, prevalence because they live so long. But for lung or neuroendo lung neuroendocrine tumors, it really is a very significant increase. And the, the latest, the SEER data up to 2012, shows this continuing. Is this a true increase? I mean, part of this is due to better recognition, better registration processes. Uh, a lot of patients get picked up incidentally while having either diagnostic CTs or PET CTs for other purposes. And I think with better specialized neuro, uh, neuroendocrine pathologists who are using a, a, a better profile of immunocytochemistry, and of course, as we go forward, it will be molecular profiling, we are seeing more cases, although many of them will be uh, small and incidental, particularly if we look at uh, rectal tumours uh, and some of, the, uh, some of the other sites. So within, the, um, within neuroendocrine tumours, we can see that the figures do vary, but around 25% of all neuroendocrine tumours will occur in the lung. So about 70% will occur in the gastroenteropancreatic uh, uh, tract, um, and about 5% are sort of miscellaneous site cells where. The traditional classification has been typical and atypical, and then the large cell neuroendocrine tumors, and I think, it's, I think we will see the small cell uh, tumors are essentially being taken out. Um, there are, and this is just to give us really a sort of the, to show in perspective how relatively infrequent they are, that the typical carcinoids probably only 1% to 2%, where the atypicals are around 0.1% to 0.2%. So the large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas make up quite a significant chunk, and I'm not going to talk about small cell neuroendocrine carcinomas or small cell lung cancer, although clearly they do make up a big chunk. And then there are these curious dipnecks, the diffuse interstitial pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, which may account for up to 10%. Um, and again, there's a move, in, certainly in the extrapulmonary tumors, to talk about these G3, and this is where the terminology becomes very confusing, particularly if you're not familiar with it, but the difference between G3 well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, and because uh, a G3 you think is poorly differentiated by definition. But when the KI67 is less than 55%, in other sites, the G3 well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor is differentiated from the neuroendocrine carcinoma. But I think we, are not, we, we could spend half an hour just discussing that. Within the large cells, there is this huge heterogene heterogeneity, probably explained, in fact, by this difference between the G3 net and the G3 neck. And I suspect that uh, Was uh, will cover some of this in his uh, talk. So traditionally, we've based our treatment on grade, mitosis, lymphovascular space invasion, resection margins. And although in lung, KI67 hasn't been mandatory, it's now becoming accepted. 
and nodal status. But of course, for the future, it's all going to be molecular profiling. And, and I've got a few slides which I think will perhaps illustrate to you how important that's going to be. And this is just to illustrate that the KI-67 for large cell tumors for uh, atypical and typical carcinoids, there is this big range. And clearly, if you, if, that if you're getting a low KI-67, you have a biopsy that's taken, and it's come back a small cell, and it may be just a little fragment that has been taken. I'm sure you as cardiothoracic surgeons wouldn't take little fragments, but there are some of the physicians may take tiny fragments, and the pathologists are presented with a little fragment to look at. But when they, they're, they're, so often what happens, these patients two years later, they're still alive, and somebody says, hmm, maybe we better go back and look at the pathology. And they go and do the KI-67, and they say, oh, actually, yes, it's only 18%. So it's probably an atypical carcinoid. And I do feel sympathy with the pathologists when they have to face this, but there are other techniques that are going to allow them to distinguish this. But this is, KI-67 will be accepted as part of the, uh, the management of bronchial neuroendocrine tumors. So um, the ratio of male to females by and large is uh, fairly similar, apart from in the uh, large cell, uh, uh, well, at least for the typical and atypical, it's, it's broadly similar. But for the small cell and the large cell, it tends to be more male-dominated. We know that there are a few, not many of these, but there are a few where there are causative factors. The MEN1 syndrome may account for between 5 and 15% of bronchial carcinoids. Um, there are, I'm going to show later, some in large cell neuroendocrine tumors, some new molecular markers which had just come out really in the last year or two, which appear to have prognostic and predictive importance and may explain some differences in the response to chemotherapy. There is, I think, still some controversy about how much, what the importance is of smoking. Um, and there was a recent paper just come out um, looking at adenocarcinomas who go on to get to, with, with the EGFR, the, uh, who go on to get this transformation to small cell lung cancers about 15 to 18 months after treatment. And that's another curious group. It's a very small number at the moment, but again, it shows there's some funny things going on. But most of these patients will be asymptomatic and a chance finding picked up on a chest X-ray or a CT or a PET for other reasons. But as you all know, they can present with repeated chest infections, persistent cough, usually non-productive, sometimes hemoptysis, sometimes a bit of dyspnea, chest pain. But syndromic patients, patients with carcinoid syndrome, are certainly under 10%, and some series suggest it may be as low as 2%, which is a variance from the gastroenteropancreatic tumors, where it's considerably higher. The symptoms, of course, may reflect the location, and again, depending on the, um, uh, the, the, the series you look at, probably central tumors seem to account for 70 to 90 percent, whereas the peripheral tumors are 10 to 30 percent, and these peripheral tumors are more likely to be asymptomatic and picked up by chance, whereas our central tumors are more likely to have presenting symptoms and, uh, with repeated cough, wheeze, hemoptysis, and so on, and these and sometimes it requires an astute GP. Uh, I saw a patient last week who said, oh, my, it was a locum who saw me, and he wasn't happy, and he sent me for a chest X-ray, and it picked up a, a, um, what turned out to be a typical carcinoid. And I, this is from um, a German consensus paper, which I think is quite helpful, um, where they said that we were comparing uh, central versus peripheral locations. So of all bronchiopulmonary carcinoids, 10 to 30% are localized in the periphery, and therefore mostly asymptomatic. But if the tumor is, central, is located in the central airways, then these are the typical symptoms. And it's just how few uh, present with uh, carcinoid syndrome. Very interesting paper from Wass's group just come out, I think, in, within, I think it's in the last year, isn't it? Um, we're giving some clues as to differences between central and peripheral tumors. And I, I, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder here. I think it's, but they've identified three clusters. And you can see there's TTF1, the, trans, the thyroid transcription factor, and the orthopedia homeobox protein CD44. If it's double positive, they appear to be cluster one. They look as though they're the more favorable, more females, maybe a little bit more in the way of dipnex. But if you've got TTF negative and OTP1, then these more often are central a slightly higher risk group, but then you've got the double negative, which can be both central and peripheral, but these have much more in the way of high risk features, and they don't seem to show the dip necks. And in the cluster that you can see down the bottom on the, on the left-hand side there, it does separate out into three quite distinct or relatively distinct molecular profiling groups, 
and that's reflected by the um, prognosis. So this is clearly, I think, valuable information for the future, because clearly the top ones do extraordinarily well, and um, probably, I mean, I think they do need follow-up, but they don't, certainly don't need any treatment. And these bottom ones, clearly, we need to sort of work out strategies for how to deal with them. So carcinoid syndrome is very uncommon. Cushing's is probably even less common. I think we've had about five in the last... Uh, we get about one a year, I think. I've never seen an acromegaly, a megaly, acromegalic presentation. Um, and it may be that some of these other... Uh, the, these syndromic ones may be more associated with thymic carcinoids, which is another topic. So again... Um, Tahir has commented on what sort of investigations. Um, the chromogranins clearly, and I have a bee in my bonnet about, excuse the pun, about chromogranin B, and it's not in the literature, but for, for, uh, sort of we're, we're reviewing our own experience, because I think the chromogranin B is actually quite a useful marker in um, bronch, bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumors. Obviously, for the higher grade tumors, neuron specific enolase may also be of value. Um, we tend to do the full gut hormone profile, at least at baseline, and for serial follow-up, uh, I would only do chromogranin A and B. Uh, urine 5-HIA can be done, but because carcinoid syndrome is infrequent, um, it's not of great value. These things may not be useful diagnostically, but they may be useful for follow-up. Then, of course, we've got our imaging, and um, Tahir has touched upon the question of somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. Um, not everywhere has gallium. Uh, there are some parts of the country still where we use Octriascan and tetratide, uh, a technetium. But it, I mean, obviously the gallium is just superior, but Octriascan and tetratide aren't bad at picking up if the tumor is somatostatin receptor positive. This important question of if, do you do the biopsy first or do you do the imaging and then go, if you could then go straight to surgery on the, or without doing the biopsy, you, you may actually sort of miss out doing some important things. So I think there's a, there is a strong case to be made for getting a biopsy so that if you do show that it's a neuroendocrine tumor, then you can do the more appropriate neuroendocrine uh, imaging. Um, and I think there's a, there's, that, that probably will vary from MDT to MDT. And uh, we've seen pictures already. And this is just to show that you, some of the atypical bronchial carcinoids do have the funny pattern of, of uh, bone metastases, often very sclerotic. And this is just a, uh, another, um, an octria scan, in fact, with multiple bone and liver metastases. Um, this table refers to what imaging you might want to do when you, so you would tend to use, the, I mean, there's a big, we've just come back from ENETS this week, and there are many people who feel you should do both FDG PET and the gallium dota uh, PET in all patients. But I think personally, I think that's a rather extravagant use of resources, particularly for a well-differentiated tumor. And generally, you would use the somatostatin receptor scintigraphy for well-differentiated tumors, and you would tend to use FDG PET for the high-grade tumors. And I think it's probably more useful to do both imaging um, in, uh, in the sort of the, in the intermediate group, as well, the middle groups. And it's just that on the right-hand side, <clears throat> the use of the chromogranins more useful in well-differentiated, the typical and atypical carcinoids, whereas when you get up to the high end of the spectrum, then neuron-specific enolase is probably of more use. Now, I'm going to go through these in about two seconds each because it's just to show you there are lots of different groups. There's the ENETS algorithm. There's this algorithm from Hendifar's group. There's another one for the UKINETS pocket guideline. I'm not sure it's actually been published yet. It's certainly... Um, I was involved in, in the draft of it. There's the NCN, NCCN guidelines. Um, all these guidelines are out there, and they all are broadly similar. I've touched upon this issue of the sample size, particularly if it's just from an e-bus, and you get a tiny fragment, and decisions are made on this. And I think this is where KI-67 can be extremely valuable, because a high KI-67, if it's in the 60, 70, 80, then you know you're dealing with either a small cell or a large cell tumor. But if you've got a KI-67 that comes back under 20%, then you're probably dealing with an atypical carcinoid, and your whole management philosophy will change. And equally, if it comes back in the 20 to 55%, it's probably going to be a G3 net, uh, which again has a different, uh, different clinical behavior, may well be uh, a candidate for a radionuclide therapy, and certainly does better with certain types of chemotherapy. And as I said, if you've got a patient still alive at two to three years with small cell, then I think you need to go back and, and review it and see what was done. 
I think I'm going to skip. I'm, I'm, I put too many slides in, so I'm going to skip the dip next. Tahir has um, talked about the multidisciplinary team approach, and clearly with the specialist uh, pathologist, uh, making sure that you get the appropriate grading and the perforation and the KI-67. Um, we're moving towards, although it's not yet established, but we're moving towards the use of molecular markers, and we will, I think, in the course of the next few years, have the liquid biopsies, circulating DNA, and it was amazing that, that uh, uh, the ENETS, um, I'm sorry, this may be a wasted, uh, wasted remark on most of the audience, but at the ENETS meeting uh, this week, the NET test was only mentioned about twice. And in fact, the great pro uh, protagonist of the, of the NET test didn't even refer to it as the NET test. He just talked about circulating blood markers. But there's a lot of money in this, and it's all set up by a private company based in the States, but they're making sort of somewhat outrageous claims. I mean, clearly it, it is, has a potential value, but I don't think it's a panacea. So and many of these uh, techniques will allow you to target your treatments, and it's, um, surgery remains a vital part of the management. And there are a place for radiation, there's a place, uh, particularly with the ra uh, radionuclide receptors, and there's a place for drugs. So I've showed, talked about the left-hand side of this slide before with the traditional um, histological markers, but the future is molecular profiling because this is clearly, I mean, we talk about it a lot, but I think it is a, a genuine thing that we are going to be personalizing therapies. And that can be with somatostatin receptors, which will allow you to select patients who may be suitable for um, treatment with a compound called lutetium, which is peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. But there are emerging uh, uh, tips that may help you to select chemotherapy or may explain why certain chemotherapy it, regimes do less well. Um, we know that with, with the low-grade carcinoids, they tend to have a low mutational burden. You can demonstrate the MEN1 gene. They may have PI3 kinase, AKTM TOR, which may explain why some subgroups do better with Everolimus. Um, but there are other aggressive variants that, can, that are identified, and just, this is touched upon really in the, um, uh, the Papazoinis, I can never get tongue around his name, but Papazoinis paper uh, with, with Weiss in which they identified the three different clusters, and the loss of Orthopedia homeobox may be an important predictor in that. Again, I'm just going to go through these next, there's five, I've just, what I've done is just to highlight these, but essentially it's looking at typical, atypical, large cell, we can skip the small cell, but showing the different markers that are there. And then clearly we see that the KI-67 is um, lower in the, in the, on the left-hand side than the typicals. And we, as we go through, we can see that there are different, since this is so faint, I can't see it here, but there are different, um, there are different markers that come through and we go through to the end, and as you can see, some of them become, some of them are just diagnostic and prognostic, and some may have therapeutic, predictive therapeutic influences. So again, you know, if, if anybody wants the, the copies of these slides, I'm more than happy to share it with you. And Aldo Scarpa's group uh, from Italy, again, have come up with some interesting data, and there's also a the Dutch group from Dirks, looking at um, different, particularly in large cell neuroendocrine tumors, and again, uh, this is pretty, pretty new stuff, and it's still sort of not been validated in terms of its, its use therapeutically. But what they are showing, what they've been showing within these large cell neuroendocrine tumors, there's a high mutational burden, and there may be some mutually exclusive gen genomic subtypes. The TP53 and RB1, which is seen in small cell lung cancer, and then this, these other two, the TP53, the STK11, uh, and this, I've, never, I've never heard of this Kelch-like ECH-associated protein before um, these papers came out. But these may, and I'm, I'm not sure how much uh, Wass is going to cover this, but they may give some explanation why platinum-based regimes don't work in everybody. So I think this is for the future rather than for today. Um, and again, the, the, we can see, I, I'll skip these I think, in the interest of time. So... The typical carcinoids very rarely metastasize, um, whereas the atypicals, you, clearly you can see around 70% uh, do, well, well about, sorry, about 25 to 30% do metastasize and will die. I mean, they're still capable. We all see typical carcinoids where something goes wrong, but it, it is relatively uncommon, and these molecular markers will probably explain this in the next few years. 
So the typical carcinoids, it's probably under 20%. It's more like closer to the 5 to 10%. But of course, they do have this pattern of late relapse, which is why I think follow-up is very important <clears throat> and follow-up in, in specialist centers rather than bouncing them back to the respiratory physicians, or in some cases they may go to the CNS-led clinic. I have no problems with this. That's not meant to be in any way a dis, uh, uh, derogatory to the CNS, but the CNSs in lung cancer do not really have, I think, an understanding of the differences with neuroendocrine tumors, and I think I have, I have a, strong, uh, a strong view about this. So... Again, we've, it's a bit iterative that we know that there are factors like the KI-67, um, there are other predictive factors that we were sort of well-established histologically. From the literature, we can see that, I mean, this is just all neuroendocrine tumors. If it's localized at the top, it does better than if it's got a regional disease or distant disease. I mean, that sort of applies to all neuroendocrine tumors. Um, this is from a, a large study, this is from the, uh, from the United States, again, looking at typical, and the, the brain is one we really want to look at, the typical and the atypical stand out, and then the large cell and the small cell do less well. Um, and this is, again, looking at KI-60, I think, is it? no, sorry, this is uh, just, again, the typical, another series with typical and atypical uh, from another center in the U.S., clearly showing uh, the differences. Um, and here it's looking at the KI-67, again, indicating the importance of the top line, the very low KI-67, 0 to 2, to, in fact, they've chosen 2 to 10, whereas the 20% the, the will be the cutoff. Japanese data, so we often question whether data from the, the, the Far East, is, the biology of tumors may be different, but it's really showing a remarkably similar. Uh, this is all stages, and this is in stage one, in fact, that it, it's showing a sort of similar sort of pattern. So there is this late relapse, the importance of follow-up, <clears throat> not many patients will develop carcinoid syndrome, but particularly for the atypicals, um, you do get these patients who do get particularly liver, uh, sorry, get bone metastases with mixed sclerotic and, li and lytic, um, particularly the sclerotic, which can be very troublesome. And uh, an interesting talk was given at ENETS this week from Rob Coleman in Sheffield. I think that made a few people think about how we should be treating these. And there are drugs that are used in breast cancer that have an important therapeutic effect, and we're probably underutilizing them. Who follows them up? Where should the follow-up take place? How often, how long, and what do we do? Again, we could probably spend 20 minutes doing this. I refer you to the ENETS guidelines. I think they are probably, for Europe, they are probably um, the most useful. Um, at least my view is now, and I've changed it, but I think they should be seen at least annually. I mean, obviously, the large cell ones you see more frequently, but typical and atypicals at least annually, and I personally, I think, for 10 years. Big debate about how often you image them. Um, I think, again, it's at least an annual sort of imaging and annual chemistry. Um, I think it's the ENETs. The ENETs say every three years I do a CT. Um, I think the ENETs also say you should do a bronchoscopy every, th every three to four years. I think your own, your own MDT should um, make a decision, and you, and you have a policy locally as to what you do. But I think they do need, the important thing is they need follow-up by somebody who's interested in neuroendocrine tumors. And it doesn't matter what specialty that person is, as long as he or she has an interest in neuroendocrine tumors. Um, again, yes, yeah, so the, the ENETS guidelines suggesting sort of that fiber optic bronchoscopy should be done maybe at five to 10 year intervals uh, or, or more often. And they don't say how often you should do it. So I think the workload there is a bit worrying. So in conclusion, these are previously considered rare tumors, but the incidence is rising. The prevalence is certainly rising because of their long survival. The importance of databases and registries, and this is where UKINETs and the ENETs are important. I've highlighted the importance of the new pathological classifications and the what I think that if whoever's giving this talk in five years' time, it will probably be a completely different talk because the molecular markers are going to have such an important impact. We're going to hear about the new treatments, which I will skip, and I thank you for your attention, and I apologize if I've overrun.